Hello and welcome to our week four supplemental lecture on Robert Merton's The Normative Structure of Science. This is one of the shorter and more straightforward readings this week. I'll still walk through it. Merton is concerned with the relationship between science and the surrounding cultural values that either enable or hinder the values specific to scientific research. So he'll give us his understanding of what science is, and then there'll also be a running commentary that will be useful preparation for some of the topics we'll discuss in the Politics Week uh, about the relationship of science and broader political and economic structures. So when he's writing, which is in the early 40s, uh, he's concerned about a revolt against science. He talks about there being a historical shift where not that long ago it was possible to talk about, he says, the faith of Western si culture in science being unbounded, unquestioned, unrivaled. Now, he says, local contagions, interesting word, local contagions of anti-intellectualism threaten to become epidemic. What he's thinking of in the time that he's writing are forms of irrationalism and anti-scientific thought or controls of scientific thought that are going on in fascist movements in Stalinist Russia in various forms of nationalism. So he's not thinking about you know, alternative medicine or some of these things that sometimes get characterized as anti-intellectualism today. He's talking about government activities and ideologies. There's an opportunity in this attack on science. He says, crisis invites self-appraisal. He points out that in its foundation, science had to explain itself, justify itself, and defend itself to social groups and political institutions that were not at all convinced of its value. We need to do that again, he says. Uh, and so we're just replicating a process that's not alien to science, but that science has lost the knack of doing because it's been so transcendent for so long. He says that the term science refers to several different things, only one of which he's going to talk about in this piece. It can refer to methods for certifying knowledge. It can refer to the body of accumulated knowledge itself. It can refer to the values governing scientific activities or any combination of these things. He's going to explore the values element of things. He's going to look at something that he calls the cultural structure of science. And then he's got a section talking about the ethos of science. What are the things that drive it? And here he's going to outline the basic structure of the paper to come. He says that this exploration sits inside a larger framework, which would look at the institutional structure of science. He's not going to look at its entire institutional structure, but he is going to look at particular values that motivate scientific work and talk a little bit about the kinds of institutional drives and pressures that those values imply. He says that the values of science arise from its goals and its methods. He says its goal is the expansion, the extension of certified knowledge. It's the second time he's used that term. Uh, so the idea that the it's not just any knowledge, it's specifically got an imprimatur on it, a certification uh, of scientific authority. And then it also arises from certain methods. There's a requirement that what counts as knowledge be both empirically confirmed and logically consistent statements of regularities. He says effectively these are predictions, if only predictions that things will continue to operate in the future as they have in the past. He says that there are a lot of technical justifications or practical reasons that one could endorse what's happening in science, but that the scientific enterprise itself thinks of its values as binding because they are believed right and good. It's not just that they're efficient, it's not just that they have good practical effect, um, but they are understood as moral, not just technical prescriptions. And he says there are four particular institutional imperatives that form the ethos of science, and he lists them as universalism, communism, disinterestedness, and organized skepticism. And those he thinks are at the, the value core of science, and he's going to break them down one by one. So for universalism, he says that the universalism of science is associated with a notion that if someone puts forward a claim, you assess that claim against pre-established impersonal criteria. And those criteria are that the claim is consistent with observation, 
and that the claim is consistent with confirmed knowledge. This will be phrased in different ways by other people that we're reading this week, but these are common things to highlight, that you need to both have evidence for the position that you're putting forward, and that the position you're putting forward has to have some plausibility in terms of prior evidence. He says the attributes of the person making the claim are in principle irrelevant. Objectivity, he says, precludes particularism and the imperative of universalism is rooted deep in the impersonal character of science. The tricky thing is that in many cultures in which scientific institutions operate, universalism is not an accepted value. Particularisms of various kinds are in the cultural ascendancy, and that this can hinder science's own universalism. And he points specifically to ethnocentrism, to international conflicts, to wars, and to nationalism as things that can distort the operation of scientific institutions. So if an institution, for example, is not allowed to consider the claims made by someone who lives in a different country or is associated with a different block in a war, or if institutions are not allowed to engage with what, he doesn't mention it here, but an example would be from women or from people of other races, then this can impede the basic underlying universalism. It excludes potential sources of valid knowledge. He says the profession must be open to talent regardless of other characteristics, but again broader social values outside the scientific enterprises can get in the way of this happening. And he talks specifically about caste restraints and things like this on who can participate. He talks about an affinity or consistency between democratization and this particular kind of universalism. And he specifically dangles out the possibility that the kind of democratization required may be something that needs to be enforced by governmental intervention into society. So he talks about a more kind of freewheeling democratization that can result, he thinks, in sort of clumps of disadvantage and advantage that are not as universalistic as science would ideally benefit from. And so he conceptualizes a possibility of having interventions intervene into democracy, institutions intervening, to make democracy itself more universal. Then he does a very interesting thing, particularly for when he's writing. He outright says that a central value of science is communism. And what he means by that is common ownership of goods, specifically intellectual property. He says, the substantive findings of science are a product of social collaboration and are assigned to the community. They constitute a common heritage in which the equity of the individual producer is severely limited. Property rights in science are whittled down to a bare minimum by the rationale of the scientific ethic. This is an extremely interesting way to say this. This comes up in our other readings, but it comes up under the label of publicity. You have an obligation, the way we talked about in looking at Kant, to publish your results, to participate in a public discussion of them, a public debate. But the idea of specifically looking at what this might imply for property rights, for the ownership of the ideas, hasn't actually come up in the other materials that we've looked at so far. Merton just lays it on the table. He says that your rights in the scientific enterprise are pretty much limited to reputational esteem. You can do something that really, really impresses other scientists. And so you can gain in status by doing that, but you don't really own the ideas. He calls it a process of competitive cooperation. So there's a push to originality, and it drives scientists to compete with each other. But whatever comes out of that competition, whatever results come out of the science, are understood as common property, where the producer gains a higher reputation. The reputation may be greater depending on the greatness of the contribution to the commons, but it is essentially a commons. Okay, now it'd be an interesting question whether this is still an accurate description of the way that science is operating at the present time. Okay, there's a lot more pressure to privatize the knowledge, to monetize the knowledge, uh, to patent and otherwise protect the intellectual property. It would be interesting to see whether Merton's definition of science is something that is limited to a particular period of time. He talks about the pressure for full and open communication. So in a lot of the things we're reading, people are talking about the right to fully and openly communicate findings. But Merton says this also is a pressure that 
it's looked down upon to conceal your results, not just when you're concealing bad results or embarrassing results, but when people are concealing very important results. And he talks about some examples in the paper of people who made really, really interesting, important, fundamental discoveries, and then for whatever reason sat on them. They didn't share them with the public. And this is sort of almost a moral violation of the process of science of participating in that community. He says there's also a characteristic humility of scientists. And he talks about Newton's statement. So Newton, a great figure who makes powerful, important discoveries, but talks about only being able to make them because he stood on the shoulders of giants. And this is expressing a certain thing, a recognition that you're only getting whatever results you're getting as part of a collaborative process with other people working alongside you in your own time and also with previous generations. Okay. Your results would not be possible without all of those others, and that's recognized in the communism of the space. And he says this is incompatible with the private property drive of, capitalist, of the capitalist economy. He's not here proposing institutional solutions, he's just making these observations. Disinterestedness. And this is an interesting one in terms of how he approaches it. He says, the quality of disinterestedness doesn't derive from the individual motivational structures of the scientists, but from institutional pressures and sanctions. So it's not that scientists are just such wonderful people that they will do things altruistically for the rest of humankind. It's that there's an institutional structure in place that provides high incentives for good practice and effectively sanctions poor practice. And the end result of that is something that looks like a disinterested process overall. He then makes an extremely optimistic statement. He says, the virtual absence of fraud in the annals of science, which appears exceptional when compared with the record of other spheres of activity, has at times been attributed to the personal qualities of sciences. There is, in fact, no satisfactory evidence that this is the case. So scientists are no better as people than anybody else, but there's something better about the institutional structure. And for Merton, as for many of the people we read this week, that has something to do with the competitiveness of the process and the way that it encourages scientists to scrutinize and self-police the work of other scientists. It's still probably gilding the lily a little bit for him to say there's been so little fraud, even in the time that he's writing. Fraud was an issue. There were a number of prominent cases of it. Uh, how it compares to fraud in other spheres, I'm not sure, and it's not something that he analyzes in detail here. But this is also a major issue now, and particularly the question of whether the institutional structures of science need to be made more robust around fraud and various other kinds of misrepresentation. And we can talk about that as we go forward with this topic. But he says, one reason that there might be less fraud than you might think as well is that the work has to be addressed to an expert community. So it's not like you're giving a service to clients who might be naive, who might not know a lot about the field. You're addressing your work to your peers. And so if you do anything fraudulent, you are more likely to be caught than you might be if you were talking to a layperson. Now, again, there are debates today over how effective some processes like peer review are in actually catching fraud. Uh, the answer seems to be that sort of over a period of time, processes can work reasonably well, but things can stand. People can get away with it for periods of time. And there are debates going on internationally at the moment about how to improve the detection of things like fraud. But then he goes to governmental systems, and he's particularly concerned here with totalitarianism as an example where he says the borrowed authority of science bestows prestige on the unscientific doctrine. So the tendency of particular states to direct science to particular results, to engineer findings that are convenient to the state, and yet to present those as though this is somehow still science. So they benefit from the veneer of disinterestedness when in reality the results have been pre-given all along. And then the final thing he discusses is organized skepticism. This habit, and again, this is something that we've been looking at in figures uh, really from Bacon forward, that to interrogate everything. 
to look at all facts and all possibilities, to suspend judgment, to question established beliefs, to look at everything and see if we can come up with a firmer foundation for accepting or believing in it by going through the process of skepticism. We looked at the Descartes piece where this is thematized particularly explicitly. Merton says, the scientific investigator does not perceive the cleavage between the sacred and the profane, between that which requires uncritical respect and that which can be objectively analyzed. So it flattens distinctions. It will criticize, left to its own devices, everything. And that's okay within the structure of science. But it generates a lot of tensions within the broader culture. And Merton says, this appears to be the source of results revolts against the so-called intrusion of science into other spheres. The idea that science should stay in its place and that there are sacred spheres within society that it should stay out of. Such resistance on the part of organized religion has become less significant as compared with that of economic and political groups. The opposition may exist quite apart from the introduction of specific scientific discoveries which appear to invalidate particular dogmas of church, economy, or state. So it's not necessarily driven by some specific finding. It is rather a diffuse, frequently vague apprehension that skepticism threatens the current distribution of power. So it's an opposition not to a particular scientific finding or result, but to the institutional practice of skepticism as such. And again, he talks particularly here about totalitarian societies combining anti-rationalism and centralized control to put stark, stark limits on scientific skepticism. Some of these themes we'll return to when we look at our politics topic in just a few weeks. It also interacts in interesting ways with some of the other readings from this week that are not talking as explicitly about political systems or are only talking about them in sort of lesser detail. So we'll pick this up in class.